Um, I'm Jennifer Doyle, and um, I'm here uh, because I started playing as a just for fun in my 30s, and then I went kind of crazy and started blogging about soccer in 2007. And then um, the next thing I knew, I was like writing about sports. And um, my background is in like career performance studies. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, I have a blog now, The Sports Spectacle, which has been really quiet. Um, probably because I'm working on another project and I'm saving myself for the Women's World Cup. And, um, and um, yeah, so that'll be alive soon. Um, <coughs> Um, and uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm a little bit nervous. I get nervous around um, athletes whom I admire and have admired for a long time. So like, don't be oh, nervous. I totally get starstruck. So. We're just um, nerds. We're super lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll show shake. them your wiffle ball pitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and uh, just to say a little bit, like, I, um, as to, like why, and also I think this might go to some of the underpinnings of this conversation. Um, uh, my mother uh, uh, was in the 70s a Title IX activist in Pennsylvania, and uh, she participated in a statewide effort to basically file lawsuits against school to schools all over the state. There were around 50 lawsuits filed, I think, in 1974 by individual chapters of the National Organization for Women. And some of my earliest memories as a, as a child of like my parents' sort of life, like outside being parents, was of uh, now meetings in the house, which were often actually about um, Title IX interventions in schools. And um, um, I've kind of been talking about this with her a little bit lately, and that's been like a really illuminating conversation about what um, activists in the 1970s imagined that they were fighting for. One of them being uh, the rights for um, uh, girls to compete directly, physically against boys in school, right? So. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, my sisters were both Title I, um, IX um, scholarship athletes in a Division I uh, university where they ran track and field. One of my sisters is a D3 coach in cross country and track and um, um, Ramapo College in New Jersey. Um, anyway, so um, I have like personal, <coughs> personal links into the story of athletics. So I'm just going to briefly uh, in, uh, um, um, indicate uh, who's on the panel. So, um, uh, so Cindy Parlow come, um, and uh, Cindy is a former um, head coach for Portland Thorns. We've actually just been chatting about a story about the um, Thorns in the Guardian, um, and um, um, is a retired professional soccer player, two-time Olympic gold medalist, a founding member of the Women's United Soccer Association, and um, Carla Overbeck, defensive coach for the um, team here, right? and yeah, and um, played in my right, every World Cup from 1991 to 99. Correct. Right. Yes, and in two Olympics. That's right. So, um, and then uh, Brenda Elsley and um, Jen Schaefer, and um, and uh, they are both Latin Americanist historians and who are working on um, on um, uh, sports and um, uh, uh, football more specifically and uh, women's football within that. So um, and so the, the kind of loose focus for this panel um, is you know to have to have a conversation. With um, sort of about uh, strategies for developing women's soccer, incorporating um, women's soccer into existing sports institution institutions, experiments with cultivating alternate institutions, um, and the like. And so, one of the things that makes me really excited about this panel is that here we have, um, um, in particular, historians with an awareness, right, of the longer, like the longer arc of. Um, uh, women's football in relationship to the sport more generally, um, and two athletes who also have organizational experiences of different kinds. And um, and so, yeah, these, those are various general questions, and I'd like to maybe um, start by directing attention to the athletes on the panel to talk a little bit about your experiences with different kinds of moments in um, the organizational history of the sport. <coughs> um, maybe perhaps things that you thought, like struggles that from which you learned something that you tried to maybe import into um, more recent work, um, or like moments that were really empowering and exciting. Um, when there's a history, Carla's older than me, so That's right. um, she can go back a little bit. I think it makes sense from her to start it off. Well, I know, um, you know, when the women's national team, I think, started in, you guys are probably know this better than I, but maybe 85, and um, before their it was in the Olympics that there had to be a World Cup. So the first ever was World Cup in the 91. Um, and, you know, 
fast forward to 95 and then fast forward to 99, people didn't think that they would come out, the fans would come out and watch our team play. And so our organizing committee, thank goodness, uh, Marla Messing and Donna De Verona, um, had a big picture sort of, um, you know, they, they wanted, they, they saw, I think, what the good in this team was and they thought that people would come out and watch us play. Um, and so, you know, all the naysayers out there were saying, oh, go to the high school stadiums and no one's going to come watch you guys play. And um, fortunately for them, they kind of forged on and we as the players knew our responsibility. We had to continue to promote. So every city we go into, we, you know, do clinics and we do um, things, press conferences, to try to raise awareness um, for our sport and the World Cup. And, um, you know, I'm not so sure that many athletes have to do that nowadays, but that's kind of, that was our nature. We genuinely enjoyed being with kids and, you know, promoting our sport. And and fortunately, you know, people did come out and watch us play, but everyone was like, oh, they're not going to come watch you guys play. It's a women's soccer event. And, um, and, and we sort of felt a responsibility, not just for that time, but for all the women that have fought before us. And, and like you said, with the whole Title IX, we were like a product of Title IX. And we understood that and we realized that, you know, women weren't able, weren't able to play soccer back in the day. And so they fought hard for us to be able to, you know, have this moment. And so we felt a responsibility, not only um, as a team to promote, um, we knew we had to continue to win. And also we felt a responsibility to all those women that had worked so hard before us um, and sort of make them proud of what they had done. And, you know, here's the, the end result of this, this team that's very successful. But then also open the roads to those that came after us. Um, there were a lot of battles um, in all different aspects, uh, specifically speaking to 99. Um, and we wanted to fight those battles so that the players that came after us didn't have to fight those same battles. So we set a standard where, um, with the Federation and with everything that we did, that this is moving forward, that they wouldn't have to go back and refight the same battles that we fought. So it was, we wanted to leave the game, but especially women's national team, young girls, we wanted to leave the game a better place than where it was when we came in. And it's not like we were asking for millions of dollars. You know, we, we, saw it. <laughs> we saw what and how the men's team, how they were treated, and, you know, the financial backing that they got. I mean, even from FIFA, you know, your country would qualify and you'd get a million dollars. And so um, we knew that wasn't happening on the women's side, but at the same time, you know, we just wanted to play a game that we loved. And Billie Jean King was our best friend during those times. And when we were having negotiations with our federation because she had gone through that same ordeal with tennis and you know we were we were very unified and you know to credit everyone on that team is they saw the big picture and they realized that when we left this team we wanted to leave it in a better situation than how we found it and so um you know we fought we had some levers the olympics it was coming up and um, you know, people like Mia Hamm would basically get the same salary that, you know, we would get. And um, no one was demanding of lots of dollars, and we spread it out among our team and massage therapists. And so we really realized, you know, one, we weren't selfish in that way, and we absolutely put the team first. And not just the team, but for the future of soccer in the United States and then also worldwide. I mean, I, I wish... I can't even count how many times other, you know, teammates or other uh, women from other teams would come up and just say, you know, because we sort of forged the way Joy Fawcett and I, because we had kids, and you know, never before had the federation had to had to deal with that, and so, you know, they would come up to us and they'd say, you know, how'd you ask the federation? You know, did they support you? Did they, you know they give you extra money? What did they do? And so, we felt like we kind of helped, you know, the other countries as well. Uh, not just as on that aspect, but then also, um, you know, how do they go to their federation and get things that maybe they haven't had in the past? Do you think there's a tension between, um, like, 
the movement towards professionalization and then the maintenance of that kind of a collective mentality in terms of the way the team works together um, in relationship to advocating for sport? You know, it was funny because we weren't making any money. I mean, we barely had health insurance. Um, we get per, we get like 10 bucks a day for per diem. And um, we knew that once we started to, to make money, it would change things. And so um, we were kind of embarking on new territory because the Federation had never had a women's team that, you know, had one, been that successful, and two, you know, <coughs> thought about the future. And so... Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that we were unified because we wanted to continue to better, to better the sport and fight for all the future girls and then make the ones that fought before us proud. Um, can I spin the question towards the folks? Yeah, the maybe these guys are powerful <laughs> signs, which is this, you know, to say like in your research, like, uh, are there like specific um, um, stories around like women's teams or women's size like, where you can kind of see like a uh, kind of, um, um, I don't know, like, like that story around professionalization or around feminist activism or, um, um, yeah, the kind of political life right around women's football. Um, are there stories there in your research that you'd like to think might be interesting to share in this context? Context. Sure. I think that I think that you've actually loved that the unofficial women's world cup as well, and yeah. it's something that I've written about um, as well in 1971. Um, so I think six teams, including French and Italian sides. And after that event in, in Mexico City, um, which generated a lot of publicity and a lot of spectatorship, um, the French and Italian team both toured around the U.S. playing friendly matches against each other. Um, or that might have been club teams playing um, friendly matches. But it wasn't so much about who won the game, but creating a spectacle about women's soccer. And this coincided with the growing conversations of Title IX. So I, I, when I was doing that research and when I was thinking about the impact that two teams touring around the U.S. and modeling soccer for large audiences would have, I think that I'm interested in, in thinking about the long relationship that Title IX activism has specifically with soccer um, and women playing soccer. Um, so I. I don't know if it's simply coincidental that that was the immediate um, women's sporting event that preceded Title IX passage, um, but I think that it did shape the way that young women were considering the way that they might participate in sports um, after the passage of Title IX. In terms of uh, tension with professionalization, the way it's different in, in Latin America, and I, I unfortunately, you know, I'm not a representative of Latin American soccer because I'm a U.S. academic, but the research that I've done is that in the 30s and 40s, clubs would integrate women along with children in a particular category. And professional clubs are owned mutually by members. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. And here I'm talking about South America and Colombia specifically, right? So I can't speak to CONCACAF, which has a different history. Um, but they were integrated in the 30s and 40s as separate. So you would have your kind of ladies teams here and there. And then Brazil, and it might be interesting to compare with the ban on women's soccer in England. Brazil bans uh, women's soccer in 1941 until 1970. And it's one of the sort of most notorious bans. They actually cite the English um, ban. And then there's, uh, Josh can speak to other CONCACAF uh, situations. But I mean, it, it, then it's just it's just about underground institutions that keep it alive, and it's amazing. In some ways, it's it really thrives in these parts of Brazil that you wouldn't expect uh, during the the major the major ban. So it's it's not really even attention because but it's not even legal. Like you know, we're, they're not going to you know they're not going to integrate any women's clubs in, in you know forties to seventies, and then it just really explodes. Uh, in the 1980s, but I think Title IX is also a huge magnet for young women in Latin America that hope to play and hope to get an education that way. What I would hope that FIFA would do, though I was sort of laughed out of Zurich, um, is, is actually try to institute, uh, you know, some type of NCAA in Latin America because the public universities are free anyhow. So all you would have to do is actually help women to you know, have living stipends. It wouldn't even be a tuition issue. Um, 
So in some ways, as much as we <coughs> might critique that NCAA, it, it, in South America anyway, that would be really exciting. The issue of professionalization now, I'm trying to fit, is just that they are sort of uh, stepchildren mm -hmm. of professional clubs in South America, and that's a culture yeah. red in Brazil will have a women's mm -hmm. side. But um, that, it's very haphazard. I mean, is that, and that's one question that I've had, I think, over the um, across a you know, few years of having kind of conversations with players who live in different parts of the world, and talk, you know, men and women talking about um, their access to the game and the like. That, um, like, a common complaint for, like, say, for example, you're talking to like a, a guy who's like a mid-level player in India. Like, the, a common complaint will be that there's a lack of professionalism in the way the club is run, and also in the way the federation is run. You know, and that, um, or you know, with uh, you know, women players in England, you know, that there's like that word professionalization pops up a lot as like a goal or a standard. But I, so I was wondering, like, actually, for players, like, what is what do people mean when they say that? You know, is it simply is it like having a wage, or is it something? Are there other like what are what would you call in your own experience like indications of something that makes the game feel professional for players in a way that's sustainable? I think there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I think one thing, professionalism is pay. So not having to have a job outside of your playing career. Um, another thing is having a field to train on and play on that's of quality. Um, so you're not moving from field to field, going all over the city, trying to find somewhere to train. And, um, and that's one of the problems we're having with the NWSL is having teams that have a consistent place to train and play. They know they're going there every day. It is their facility, um, and the quality of the grass, or even if it's turf, is high quality. Um, the other thing is just being taken care of in turn in small things, like um, not having to worry about how are you going to get to the airport for your flight to your game in, across the country. Um, is there going to be a bus that they pick us at the stadium? So just those little things instead of each player having to figure out their own way to get to the airport. I mean, these are small details, but these go along with professionalism. Having a locker room that you can hang out in and talk, chat with your, with your <coughs> other teammates that's comfortable and inviting, that you actually like being there. Um, trying to think of other things. Benefits, health insurance, um, being well taken care of when you are injured. Um, having top rate facilities and PTs and doctors to see. Yeah, somebody uh, once said to me that the workman's comp insurance was one of the highest bills that a professional team has to cover for women's for women's football um, in the U.S. And that so they, they cited something like between three to five hundred thousand dollars a year for an annual policy, um, and uh, just for like workman's comp, and uh, which made me wonder if like cut of countries which have a nationalized healthcare system, um, I would like to, I would, one might ask whether or not it makes it easier to float a professional side if your team isn't having to pony up um, for like insurance on that level. I, you know, that sounds like an, an administrative or managerial question, but um, anyway, I, I don't know. No, that's okay. I mean, and then other logistical things, like when you are on the road staying at a decent hotel, it doesn't have to be a five-star hotel, but um, a hotel that you com feel comfortable and safe in. <laughs> and like, well, why has it been so hard? I mean, has it been real? Has it been that hard for um, um, with the different attempts to create like uh, professional league or like semi pro leagues um, and the way they operate in the U.S. Like, um, is this narrative about it being hard because there is this history of the top level um, pro leagues struggling? What? Why is that? Where do you do you have a what is your sense of like what that struggle's about? Like, um, is it? Is it, are the, yeah. Well, I think there's different perspectives on that. I think from the player's perspective, um, having played in league and then I have now coached one year in the NWSL, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of things. Like, it's, it's expensive to run a league. Um, when I was doing it, it was an eight, 18 league. Now it's a 19 league. Um, I'm not sure how many were in the WSA. Do you know? You guys might know. <laughs> I can't remember. I played in it, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and the reason why that league went under is expenses. 
Um, and it wasn't necessarily due to player salaries. It was all the other expenses that go into it. Especially it was a startup, too. So you know, you're having to get everything from scratch. And we didn't share stadiums. We didn't share office staff. We didn't share anything because it was a standalone um, from the MLS. Right. Um, so <laughs> yeah, could you talk a little bit about the things that you've done um, or your experiences organizationally for, like, um, I mean, like, one of, I guess one of the things I kind of want to resist in the conversation is that we kind of veer off into the depressing story of, like, why, being, like, floating a professional women's league is so hard and unsustainable, right? And um, um, partly because, like, one of the things that we've been just kind of, like, complaining a little bit about is this um, story that was published first in 8x8 eight eight and then in The Guardian, mm -hmm. and which is, you know, on, on the, you know, certainly it's a, a celebratory and nice profile. Um, of the Thorns and their fan base and the environment there, um, but, which is awesome. Um, but um, it's also like kind of framed by, by like they're the it's like the headline is something like are the Portland Thorns the first real club in women's football, um, and that word real being taken to be synonymous with like you know twenty thousand people in the stands every match or something like that. Um, but that like the background of it is that there's never really been a real club before because the story of women's football is this kind of constant failure. And um, found that it, and so I was wondering if um, if you um, there are other ways in which you might narrate your relationship to the sport, maybe as coaches, um, um, as players, or like yeah. You know, I feel like that's kind of an incoherent <laughs> thing, but it's like how do you if the press is constantly talking about women's soccer at the highest levels, with the exception of like when the U.S. Team, when the United States wins like a major tournament, right? If the story of women's soccer is presented as kind of like a constant sort of underachievement. Um, like that's that can't possibly square with like your narratives about your relationship to the sport over um, the arc of like a career, right? Um, so I was wondering if like how do you narrate how do you narrate the highest levels of the of the women's game like yourself? Like, well, I mean, I would come from the perspective is that it hasn't been a failure. Yeah. Um, I think our women's national team and women's soccer in general in this country and in the world has increased exponentially. And so for me, that is in and of itself a success because, as we know, there's a lot that you get out of sports, especially young girls playing sports, and specifically soccer, um, even if they don't play it at the highest level of professional or on a national team. So in terms of what the sport is giving young girls who before didn't have the opportunity to play and to learn all those life lessons that we all know that you can learn through those sports and especially team sports, um, I think that's been a huge success, and it just keeps growing worldwide. Um, and the rights that that's giving more and more women and the confidence that it's giving them to stand up for their rights in their own countries, I think has been a huge success. Um, I think if we talk specifically about women's professional soccer in the United States, has it been a failure? Um, again, I would say not yet. Um, we've had two failed leagues, but we keep bouncing back. And we keep every year, the NWSL is getting better, it's getting stronger. Um, the level on the field is getting better, the level of coaching is getting better, the, the field services are getting better, everything is getting better. Are we where we want to be yet? No, not even close. But we're taking strides in the right direction, and finally we have a league that is being responsible financially. And that's with huge help from the federations of Canada, the United States, and Mexico to help make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way. Just, um, you know, yes, we have had some leagues that have suspended operation and, you know, gone gone under. But like Cindy said, it, you know, it keeps bouncing back. There is um, there is awareness is growing. I mean, look at all the internationals that want to come play in the league. Um, you know, so, and I think... I don't mean to interrupt you, but, like, one of the things that interest me and I think that we've been trying to also like as scholars and writers like kind of hold like try to figure out like how to make space for in our conversations about the sport is like we have like stories of these actual struggle right um, and inequity and it's like and then you also have the day in day out practice of the game and um, and somehow like one story kind of, kind of like overrides the other um, and so it's like how to, it's like hard to figure out how to maintain like a uh, like to, to to write about the larger structures of the sport um, um, and while like kind of having access to the things, for example, like if I was writing only about the men's game, you know, I could rant and rave, right, about like team management, the national men's program, like 
um, all the things that they're doing wrong, right? And it wouldn't be like an attack on the integrity and value of the sport as a whole. It would in fact be like that's the baseline for sports criticism, right? Like you know, it, it's sports critics do they 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 hate on their team <laughs> right. um, sometimes, you know, like and um and certainly on like the league, like there's you know you're not really a basketball fan if you don't have like a good hate rant about you know the NBA, right? Or same with football and the NFL. But with women's sports, it's like we can't even access, we can't like get to the criticism of it without having to kind of pass through the fire of, you know, like having to manifest our faith in the sport, you know. Um, anyway, so I, I, I don't know if that's like an impossible place to be or, you know, if there's a way out of that or. Well, I, I think we're getting there. I mean, I know from my experiences in Portland, we went on the, I think a seven day, seven game skid and the media was all over it, you know, and and the, and for me, I was like, "This is great." We did it on purpose. What? We did it on purpose. For me, it was like, "Great, we have arrived." Because now <laughs> the media is comfortable attacking us as if we were a men's professional team. Yeah. You know, from attacking the players to attacking attacking me as the head coach, everything. And I and for me, that was the first time I'd really seen that on the women's side of the game in any sport. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> now we gotta start winning. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was directed the only me, but, but, <laughs> but, right. but in terms of the sport in the country and globally, that was a great step in the right direction. And I'm seeing more and more of it in the NWSL. And even with our national team now, there is more criticism of our national team now than there has ever been. Um, and while those that are in the thick of it may not necessarily appreciate it or enjoy it um, in terms of what it is on the men's side we're, we're starting to get there yeah do you, uh, maybe a question for the panel as a whole which is something like if we think about like for athletes and for people people are maybe like behind the scenes with sustaining a league you have these very kind of practical sense of like what a professionalism and a successful league is right um, and um, you know, do you have a sense of like for maybe for fans or um, um, the kind of the world around women's football? Do you think that sense of like what professionalism is or what a sustainable a sustainable world looks like? Do you think that those things are different, or is it still is it really basic like basic access to material support? I think I think that the, the connection of those two ideas is actually really fundamental in terms of professionalism in, in Latin America because. For, I, Think that for um, and I, I I should I should preface this by saying I haven't done interviews with women's teams in Latin America and Argentina, um, and part of the reason why that would be very difficult to do is because they're not sustained. Um, so I think that perhaps one of the profession, questions of professionalization in Latin American women's soccer is not necessarily everything about um, field quality or. Um, travel arrangements or um, very concrete, real important things, but rather the longevity of teams, being able to sustain a team from year to year, um, even if it's a small men's team affiliated club team, um, just being able to field the team and, and consider it an important part of the, the club, uh, basically community involvement. Um, so I think, that, I think that sustainability is actually quite closely linked to mm -hmm. professionalism in, in Argentina. Well, in Comeval, also, I mean, because there's the level of the local, and then there's a kind of national associations, right? And then there's there's this regional, and so it could really be helpful also for any kind of endeavor in South America for Comeval to be more transparent in terms of its women's development money, and where it's actually going, um, because right now they don't publish those. Um, Comeval is in Paraguay, which is um, very difficult for many media members uh, to get to. There's not a ton of funding for reporting on women's soccer, so how many people get sent to Asuncion? Zero. Um, and, and, and so there's a regional level, I would also say, where there's an opportunity to put it in the positive to kind of speak, to press a little bit on Comeval and, and sort of say, there's a new president of Comeval and sort of say, where where is that? Do 
development money and the gap because, uh, you know, Brazil's done pretty well in international tournaments and it's really, you know, sustained an international team, it's sustained a professional league, not, a, not, not as successfully as in the U.S., but it's, it's, making, it, it's making big strides in terms of that, but it's still very unclear where that development money is going. It would be a huge boon yeah. to sustaining these, these women's teams. So I have like a question, a really kind of a random, just like random sports blogger question if I want to ask, um, uh, you know, which is that, like, so for like, example, in the United States, like, there's a national players union, like there's a union for men who play on the national team. Is there? There's a union for the women for women's national team players too, right? Or no? Well, we had a. Um, I'm not sure how it is now, but we had a hired this lawyer. Um, to kind of oversee and communicate with the Federation because we were going through a lot of contractual stuff with them. And so um, Julie and I and the lawyer, just as kind of captains of the team, um, would meet with him and speak with him periodically. I'm not sure if they have. I don't know if they have a union, yeah. per se. That would be, I, don't, I don't think they do. And what's weird, what I find weird, is that there's a union for national team players because they're managed by the same FA, right? The, right. And then it's not this, it's a gender segregated union, <laughs> right? Like I find like there's a part of me where yeah. it's like, that feels wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. That's it's so wrong. wrong. It feels wrong, you know? <laughs> and uh, I can't figure out why, like other other than perhaps like, is it that like the, the men are so against the idea of having women in the union that or the men, men and women players' interests are they somehow at odds with each other? Like the only reason for them not being in a manager in a union for them having separate unions would be if one was in a managerial relation to the other. But there are financial implications because there's the pot's only so big and if one group's getting one portion of the pot. What is the um, WNBA, NBA? Do they both have question. unions? They must. But I don't think they have two separate players. Yeah. So they don't have players that are, even though they're represented for the players in the NBA is female, very outspoken, um, they're still too compl considered too completely. Because I'm very unionized, but um, not by the same. I don't think there's a union, but I know um, the two lawyers from the women's team and the men's team, soccer teams, yeah. worked very closely. Right. Um, and, you know, it's not like we were wanting everything the men got, because we knew we were going to get it. You know, so we were Why just... Not? I know, <laughs> you were just like, oh, you know, I don't know. I mean, well, part of it is that FIFA... <laughs> No, funds yeah. the men's yeah. side a lot yeah. more than they fund the women's side. Totally. So when the men qualify for the World Cup, they get a lump sum of money. When we qualify, I don't know if we get anything or not. Um, <laughs> you get a handshake. Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, they would. The U.S. men would make the roster for the World Cup team, and they each get twenty five thousand dollars. And we just for making on the roster. Yes. Wow. And we would win the whole thing. And we okay. get. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, and I'm not saying we're not sour grapes about that because we played the game because we loved it. Yeah. And if they, you know, we wanted to, which is what Cindy was talking about earlier, professionalism. We wanted to play our sport, and that's all we had to do. In the early days, we had job. I mean, I worked at elementary school. I was a teacher's aide for sixth grade, and I absolutely loved that. But you know, you can't. My parents, fortunately, supported me. And they said, you know, you only have a short window to do this, do it. And so um, once we started becoming, you know, sort of the, the group that we were, we realized we have lots of leverage in this. And we don't want to have to, when we come home from a training camp or a tour, get go back to our job. Like, we want this to be our job. And it took a long time, but we finally got there. Did you want to jump in? Well, um, all I was going to say is how much of everything that we're talking about, even back to the question about, you know, football being professional, relates to soccer being a product, yeah. a women's soccer being a product that has to be sold. And, you know, Federation can just say, well, we, you know, we have this income from the men and we don't really have this income from the women, so we can't really, thinking the money has to come in, you know, through that way. So now looking at it as a business, even even going so far as to say, okay, research development, how are we developing our sport? How are we developing our product? And then you look at it over time and the evolution, that was interesting to hear, Jean, this morning, 
and then look back at things like Billie Jean King and when she separated, how long did it take for tennis, you know, like 30 years? Back in the 30s, golf, somebody separated. How long did it take? And we say now tennis and golf are, you know, the sports that are pretty much even. But I'm just curious to know how much of, a, of an impediment towards the growth of women's soccer is the fact that it's a product. And, it, and if you look at it that way, is there something that we're not doing or that we could do better? Um, and just sort of how you guys look at it from that perspective. I mean, I think maybe our federations need to do a little bit more for the women's side because, I mean, they could go to FIFA and say, you know, listen, why do you, why do you give the men's side this big bonus for qualifying and, you know, you get nothing on the women. So it's like, I, I think, and I know how FIFA works and it probably will never be equal. But the president's up for election. <clears throat> Yeah. Jane's going to run. Yeah. <laughs> but you, I just yeah. wish that they would fight more for yeah. the women, and I just haven't seen it. I mean, in my time, I haven't And those of us who kind of work and read across like the history of the sport, like, I mean, we have this kind of nagging question of what, what is FIFA for, really, when it, with, when it comes to the women's, the women's sport globally? You know, like that. Um, it, could we imagine a, a separate international organization that actually operated as, operated as a steward um, for the sport. Um, like, what is it that, does FIFA really pump that much money in it? Like, how hard is it to stage an international tournament that's of quality, right? Um, um, you know, like, where did this come from that we need FIFA to actually do that? Yeah, and why is the 91 World Cup considered the first World Cup? And it's a question of branding as World Cup or World Championship when there were international tournaments of women from different countries playing each other with very little support from their national, from their national federations, if any at all. So it, even with such little support, it happened. And it happened to great spectatorship. It, it happened to uh, yeah, 110,000. So, one, one in Azteca. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the average for that tournament was around average attendance for it was about yeah. forty thousand per game. Nineteen seventy one. Yeah. Yes. And it was Guadalajara. Yeah. yeah. Semifinal of Guadalajara was forty. Mm -hmm. Which team? It was, there were six different teams. There was Argentina. Yeah, Argentina went. Mexico, obviously. Italy. Um, Italy, France, and Netherlands, and I'm leaving out. Denmark, Denmark, Denmark. Like that was one thing that my federation. I've always said to them, why don't we play more in Mexico? Because every time we play, all they have to do is like a little bit of promotion, get it in the paper, so the people know and they'll come out. As long as people know, they'll come out, and it doesn't take that much effort. But to have somebody in the federation that's thinking about the women, because as of now, there's not one person, one employee in a six-floor building that's that's dedicated full time towards the women. And that's probably the same for most federations, except maybe the U.S. I know. Wait, did I just hear you right on that? You there's no, that? there's not one person in the Mexican Federation dedicated just for the women. <clears throat> and there's two, there's two people that are like the assistants that do the flights and things like that. But as far as in the actual building where the federation is, which is a sixth floor building where Tino Compan works, and the same for Concacaf. Concacaf just hired their first employee. What? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, if you think about it, right, you know, it's as simple as when I asked, why don't we play more games in Mexico? Well, the Federation says it costs $40,000 just to, like, say we're renting as Azteca. What if people don't show up and they don't make their money back? So it's a little bit of a risk. It's more effort. Everybody in the office has to, you know, work really hard to maybe not really make that much money back. But based on that, you know, we played a game where there was 110 people. 2003. And after that, they did nothing. We didn't play another game in Mexico City for two years. Wait, you played a, you played in front of 110,000 people. Because that's another stat that actually kind of disappears from the record. Because yeah. it's like the, the Rose Bowl match is like the only one that seems to have stuck in um, media like remembrance. And here we have even a more recent. I mean, well, it was like and what was the match? qualifier against Japan at home away? So it was the first game, and our federation was. Scared no one was going to come, so they, they opened the stadium for free and just, just took a bullet, like bit, bit, you know, like $40,000 loss. Did a whole bunch of promotion, and, you know, we probably should have won that game, and we didn't. We came back twice, tied, <laughs> didn't qualify in the end, went and didn't qualify, but I was thinking, like, if we would have qualified and if we 
could have continued with that momentum because yeah, it does take people, I think, on the business side of things, pushing and sending social messages. And, you know, for me, selling the product isn't the same as selling the men's product, but yet you have the people in the Federation that basically want to say, let's do what we did with the men because that's what they're programmed to do. Mm-hmm. But yet it's a different product. You have different audience, you have different viewers, you have different people, you know, different casts so to speak, and, and like, you know, they were saying they like to go out and, and sign autographs and stay till the very last minute, and a lot of the girls still do that. That's something that, that women just have that are special as we're very connected with our fans all the time and willing to do those things. How do you take that and turn it into, like, an advantage? Yeah. Um, Sarah's been trying to get in for a bit. Uh, yeah, so along with some of those stats, the idea of 110,000 people in Azteca and 90,000 people um, uh, in California, Tying that in with the success of tennis and um, golf is the idea of galvanizing events or moving locations, right? So for the four-day period that an LPGA event is in a particular part of the country, there's massive support and people turn out. The same thing I think is almost somewhat true for internationals, at least for the U.S. Women's National Team. You'll have 30,000 people come out to St. Louis. There's not another game in St. Louis for seven years. The next time they come out, there's a huge, there's a huge amount of support. So I was wondering if anyone on the panel had thoughts about how it seems like when you have these one-time events, the, the Women's World Cup, these major events, tremend- tremendous turnout, amazing support, um, huge, huge amounts of, of support and money is going you know, into these tournaments or these uh, internationals. And it seems like those are going really well. Um, but same thing with um, the England women selling out Wembley, 55,000 people. You know, the average attendance in the FAWSL is like 800 people. Um, the average ha- attendance in the NWSL is about 4,000 people. So. So where tennis and golf have been really successful in that they move every time for every single one of their tournaments. And they do a really good job of getting the support in Florida, in California, in Australia for those one-time events, and they benefit from that. For leagues that are playing week in and week out, 10 times a year in the same stadium with the same players, how do you galvanize attendance? How do you get people to come when it's not this once a year or once every three years type of event? Because I feel like that's the translation and the next step that I feel like women's soccer hasn't quite made yet. Because these big events are huge events. You know, the U.S. Uh, games are sold out in Canada. The final is sold out in Canada. That's great for a month in June every four years. Um, how on a, on a weekly basis um, can we try to translate that? I, I, mean, I don't I think, <laughs> I think one, thing that's been, one thing that's been successful, I mean, you see downturns in attendance beginning in the 1970s in, in men and women's yeah. games in South America because of television mm-hmm. and because of the magnet of, of you know, 800 Brazilian players a year leave Brazil to play abroad. So, you know, they're going to watch La Liga. Um, and I, I do too. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> but um, but but it, so attendance has been down. One way uh, that there's been innovations that seem to work but haven't been sustained is to find allies in the local men's games and do double headers. Mm-hmm. And this this has been pretty good. And trying to build an identity of you have both a men's and women's team in this city. Like this is Concha Fresa or this is you know Manaus and this is you know you have allies within the men's games, but not everyone, like in the Argentine case, they have not been successful in finding male allies um, that will, you know, team up and, and kind of work together. But that's been successful. Also in Colombia, just they have this golden bow game, which is a mixed match. So uh, you have to play with three women players, and uh, the first goal has to be scored by a woman, <laughs> and then it has to go every other. Oh, wow. And it's it's called Goal and Bow. They presented um, at a, a conference recently, and they're doing it because of the United Nations saying exactly what Cindy was saying: all of the benefits for young women, that it's a marker of development. So they've actually created. You can't score if the other gender is third turn. A score. woman, right? A woman has to score the first ball, and then it goes every other by gender. And 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 so I'm immediately some co-ed and the other thing about this world of defensive tactics. <laughs> But actually, what, what ends up happening is that for the first time, many men report yeah. really rooting for women. Yeah. And, oh. and they've never done that. They've never sort of, you know, and, and okay, like, I'm not saying FIFA is going to adopt it. But there are <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, 
right. I told you I've been laughed out of Zurich more than once. <laughs> but this is at least like there are innovations that are happening sometimes outside of the U.S. Um, as well. And in informal play too. In our in our own you know little university in Germany, women's goals count for two. So that also changes. Your, your tactic and your approach. I fought that in a league, the, a local league. Yeah, you pass it to it. And it is. But it changes the tenor of play. So there's, they pass you the ball in it, right? Yes, they yeah, do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, but, I do. Just, do we have, to, have questions from someone on Twitter okay. from Soul Soccer Club in California. Yeah. Two questions. One is about um, saying that are we actually succeeding if people are stopping to play at 12, right? So maybe growth, what, the relationship between growth at the youth level and then this kind of abandonment of the source sport, I guess, after 12, that's an issue. And then second is just whether whether women's soccer in the U.S. and elsewhere is sort of, is continuing to be stuck um, in comparison reaction to the U.S. men's team and whether there's some way to escape that cycle. So, and sort of follow up on that, there's a third question from the club also farther down, um, which is like, how do we measure success when it comes to women's soccer? Like, what is the... Yeah, I would say, how do we measure success in general? Because, I mean, I hate the Men's World Cup with a white hot passion. <laughs> I, I really do. I, 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 um, I logged it daily in 2010. I was on a pod, part of a podcast crew. So I had to watch just about every match. And by the end of it, I was reminded that international tournaments are specific kinds of beasts and very specific kinds of teams win tournaments. And that there's this kind of that march of the inevitable, you know, and that like, you know, there's not a really, there is not a, a correlation between the pleasure that you take in watching the World Cup and the pleasure that you take in watching your club team play, or even your national team play across the arc of the of the year. And I would even say these are almost like they're an adversarial relationship to each other. Like, but yet the men's World Cup emerges as the somehow like the the pinnacle of what we talk about when we talk about like the success of soccer as a product. You know, but you won't find a sports writer who advocates for the quality of that product in terms of play, mm -hmm. right? And in terms of the health of the game globally from grassroots to the top level. In fact, many people would say that the production of that kind of a spectacle is corrosive to the grassroots game and the development of the game and the development of individual players because it produces like EPL as a product that's broadcast internationally and has this kind of like toxic adverse adversary relationship to people's investment in the local game, especially in developing countries for the sport. You know, so, well, sorry, I went off on a rant. No, that's okay. okay. Doesn't FIFA um, sort of make their product the, um, the pinnacle of the sport worldwide? Like, when they had the quote, you know, the first Women's World Cup in 91, but not really the first Women's World Cup, they didn't, the trophy was totally different from, like, the real World Cup trophy. And then, you know, they have, when the Olympics when I was playing soccer in the Olympics now, you know, it's like an under-23 team. So it's like you can't bring your best players because I think FIFA wants their event to be it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just not a stewardship relationship to the sport. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's sort of a different uh, track conversation. Like Carly, you had mentioned that your parents supported you. If you're right. starting because you weren't, because of the situation you were funded, you weren't paid probably $10 today can't even buy your smoothie. Like, or maybe one and a half, or half, I don't know, one and a half. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Like, you can't go with you. Come on, Chapel Hill, I'll give you cheaper. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you do. Um, okay. um, but uh, to bring you to a different question about the grassroots development, within, and not just within the United States and Canada and North America, it creates massive inequalities in terms of accessibility to the sport in general for, like, youth, particularly girls, who's priorities of families in particular if they're children of immigrants or in like marginalized communities, they don't have access to it at all. Like how many people are actually able to help foster and that must have restricted and continues to restrict and do you feel like from the programs you've been seeing, um, children from a, like different community to young girls are having access to the sport now. Do you see that at all? More so than you did maybe when you were young? I think, or? well I, I mean I grew up in Dallas, Texas, so big metropolitan area. So I had lots of opportunities to play on, you know, good club teams. Um, but you know, even for St. Lily coming from littler places, or maybe inner city kids that aren't having that opportunity, I know. I think there are lots of organizations out there now that are like bettering that, you know, so that I, you know, I don't travel around as much doing inner city work. But um, I know once I started doing that and. And you know, just learning about 
the opportunities kids are getting now. I mean, obviously they're not touching all of the kids, which would be what you want. Um, but I think it definitely has gotten better. Um, I feel like we kind of well, um, drifted away from that set of questions that came to us from Twitter, which was about what the marks, and also what you were kind of asking about, um, like attendance and um, um, in club, in club, for club play in particular, and like, you know, what works or, you know, what, why is it so hard, you know, like I was wondering if anyone had like kind of, if, if especially if either of you had any sense of like what. Is what? it, was it the, from the Soul Club to keep the kids interested past 14? Was that the question? Past 12. But, past 12. But I, I guess it's, it seems like it's a basic question, right, which is also do, you know, do we pursue sort of alternate modes of development of the sport rather than trying to react in a sense, right? right? And, and I mean, so there's that sense too. I mean, what, so what, part of the question, like what happens at 12? You know, what, why is it maybe, what, what happens at that moment? I mean, I, I, I you know, what, what's that? <laughs> 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 so, but still, what happens structurally? I have no idea. No, what happens structurally, right? So that, what happens structurally so that so many people stop at that point? And, and, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the youth side of the game as well. Um, and one is, obviously, we all know that's about the time the kids are going through puberty. And they are kind of sorting themselves out as to which sport they're best suited for. And mm -hmm. sometimes um, they they may grow six inches and like, oh, I'm really good at volleyball. You know, I'm all of a sudden an effective volleyball player. Um, and I think we lose kids from soccer for other sports. Mm -hmm. I think we lose kids due to injury because, um, as we all know, with peak height velocity and those huge growth spurts, there's a huge increase of injuries at this age. Um, and a lot of kids quit due to these injuries, whether it's um, something as simple as tendonitis, they miss three weeks, and all of a sudden, oh, I'm not as interested as I thought I was. Um, and I think part of that is us changing the way we train these kids, because um, a lot of them are being overtrained, mm -hmm. especially just in soccer. So doing soccer five times a week at the age of 10 and 11, maybe a little bit much. I don't know, call me crazy. Um, <laughs> but it's like it's like shame on, and I have a 12-year-old, just turned 12-year-old, who actually plays for Cindy. Um, <laughs> That's it, nice. <laughs> but I, it's like, it's like shame. Because she practices five times a week. <laughs> yeah, every day we train. Unless we have a game, then we train twice. Yeah, and then it, then it turns into seven times a week. But, I mean, shame on the United States. There's so much wrong with youth sports and how they're specializing, and it's just, it is not good for these kids. And, you know, a lot of it is pressure from coaches playing their own sport at 12, so they give up the other three sports that they love. I mean, I, I grew up playing every single sport there was, um, and it's just, it's as a parent and, you know, someone that's been in um, sports for most of my life, it just, it makes me, in my stomach to see some of the of, of how these adults um, work with youth and how they try to make them specialize at 11 years old. Well, how do you see that changing? Because I have a 12 year old and an 8 year old, and they're already telling me it's too late for them to do X sport because oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all yeah, the other kids have been playing for five years competitively, right? I mean, and this goes back to the question of the blogger is how do we define success? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, is success that now as a coach, I'm creating a national team player. I've developed a national team player. I've developed a division one top 10 collegiate player. Or is it that I've continued to develop these people as opposed to these players to go on and to continue to have a love for the sport? Mm -hmm and continue to lead healthy lifestyles and continue to be leaders in their community. Is that where our success, or is our success solely defined by developing these players into possibly being the top players in the country or in the region or in college or whatever the standard may be? And I feel like the most coaches that I interact with, that's their goal. They want to develop these players to be the best players they can be. So yeah, maybe specialization might be important to do that. Um, but I, at my experiences on the national team, all of us played other sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
I wonder too if there isn't like actually like a fan version of this problem in a way, like which is like there's a difference between cultivating an athlete who's going to have a lifelong relationship to the sport, um, and um, and that an understanding that that may actually also be a precondition to coaching top athletes. You know that. Um, and because um, it's also about like sustainability, because it's like you know you're going to burn somebody out at 16, and what could be done that person at 12, right? <laughs> and, um, 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 but then that's also about like having a pleasure-based relationship to the sport, then the practice of the sport, and um, you know for the the fans, you know like um, I mean, and that's this is actually like a kind of almost like you know, a universal sports problem because um, mm -hmm. it's certainly um, something that people talk a lot about around men's sports as well. You know, which is the fair weather fan, but also like what the more it becomes a product, the more the pleasure that people are taking from it is from a brand, like rather than the actual practice of the sport, and that that is a kind of a uh, an odd, um, an odd kind of resource for a team because it's like purely economic and it's very separate from, say, for example, like the great histories of um, um, club environments and um, the men's game in England. You know, where you have like met, you know the sense of like. The community that's in the stands is the club, right? Um, and they're being this relatively very masculinist, like, but um, 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 direct relationship between the fan and the club identity. Whereas here, that seems to be really, um, um, uh, you know, endangered if not kind of lost, um, with the exception of perhaps college sports, I'd mm -hmm. say. And even there, we see there's that's actually like a you know, it's at a crisis point, um, and certainly with uh, individual athletes and athletes as a class kind of fighting NCAA and the way it regulates. Um, but anyway, um, this goes back to that question about like the you know women's club teams and like the 800 fans that are in the stand. I mean, like that's like a great. Re I mean, it's like you know, 800 people who care passionately about the club are a great resource, right? And how do we support them? Right? It's not just about like how you find more bodies to put in the stands, but how do you support those 800 people? Because those are the people who are going to actually see, right, see the club in a long-term history. I'm curious about whether this sort of break off at, at age 12 is specifically a soccer problem or a women's soccer problem also? It's a um, sports problem. It's a sports problem. Yeah, it's a worldwide phenomenon. But I'm actually curious about how it might actually be different in soccer. And of course, people don't study, you know, like, uh, pickup game or daily practice of soccer, but when I have seen it studied, soccer is supposedly the most practiced yeah. sport in the U.S. by mm -hmm. amateurs. So it might actually not be, it might be that many people do stop playing mm -hmm. after 12, but that many adults take it up at some point in their life because it's an easy sport to pick up to play for fun. There is a comment, also someone points out that Alex Morgan says she always started playing, she played clubs starting at 14. Mm -hmm. And kind of insists on that, which just goes in the direction of what you were saying that you know yeah. maybe the, the hyper specialization does the opposite of what yeah. it's supposed yeah. to be. I mean, there's yeah. been a lot of scientific studies done on it, and that um, playing multiple sports increases your athleticism, and mm -hmm. then you, you reach your peak mm -hmm. playing ability at a later age, which is what you mm -hmm. want. You don't want to peak at 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I wanted to comment on is in the youth sports is we focus. We, especially in the U.S., we love winners. We love to win. Um, which is part of the pressure that we felt in 99 to make it successful. We knew we had to keep winning to make the tournament a success, but mm -hmm. we've transferred that onto our youngest kids. And now, I mean, I can't even tell you some of the comments that, of the coaches that I coach against at, we're coaching 11 and 12 year olds here, um, just how much winning, how important it is to the coaches. Right. You know, yeah, the kids like to win. No one enjoys losing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not necessarily the kids' number one thing, not the number one reason why we're there. And coaches, I mean, the way they speak to the kids, the way their demeanor changes with the scoreline, it's it's appalling to me. It is absolutely appalling. I mean, um, I had shoulder surgery recently, and so I was on some pain meds, so I made my husband come with me to make sure I was keeping track of everything. <laughs> Um, and he just stood behind the bench the whole game. And after the game, he was like, he was listening to the other coach. And he was, is it always like this? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, he was pretty calm comparatively. I mean, he was blown away. He could not believe the way, not only what he was saying, but how he was saying it and how it changed with 
the score line of the game. And this was Carla's daughter's team that they were playing against, so U12, so they're 11 and 12 years old. And not even in the top division. Mm -hmm. So this is, so, I mean, I think that's an issue that, I don't know how we combat it, how we change it, um, but it's a societal problem. And I think uh, academics are, to some extent, um, uh, bound up in this process because if you look at the bulk of the academic material that's written, I know there's the sports studies stuff that tends to be based on the top end of, uh, of the athletes, but also the, the historical and the, the bulk of academic art, art, articles are on the elite of male football. So in gendered terms, if you look at the process by, whereby a young boy goes into an academy at the age of eight or nine to become a professional footballer, it's an absolutely brutal labour system. Yeah. And by definition, the majority of those kids are going to dream of becoming a footballer from eight or nine, and they're not going to make it. Maybe one in a hundred is going to make it. So in drawing attention to the problems in the women's game, very often the problems in the male game, and I know you have the same thing over here in American football, the problems in the male game are that it's a, a brutal system from a very, very young age. And that doesn't seem to be written about or reported. Mm -hmm. or... Yeah. One of my favorite football memoirs is Eamon Dunphy's, I think it's called the, It's Only a Game, yeah. which is just a, a memoir of a player. He's playing for Millwall in a season. It was the season after they had done well. and um, But the season during which he kept the memoir, they do very poorly. And I think he ends up also on the reserves. So I think maybe they get even relegated and he's on the reserves. It's like the most abject season that a professional footballer who had risen to that level could possibly have upon having risen to that level. And it's and one of the things that strikes you when you're reading it is the recognition that this must actually be what the majority of professional footballers' experiences is, which is that of losing constantly, <laughs> right? And then fighting for access, like getting any time on the field, right? Um, and um, you know that that the whole his whole access to pleasure. Which is really prominent in the beginning. He's super romantic. He just he uses terms like love to describe his relationship to the sport and other players. But he's like uh, uh, like kind of crippled with player depression by the end of the season, you know. And um, and it's also partly because his access to the game has been completely mediated. Like it's it's very it's incredibly restricted and limited. And that this is what like your profession. This is what professionalism is, right? <laughs> this is what the professional game is. And um, anyway. Well, can I just, when we were talking about success or what success means, or did you want to, I'm sorry, were you, okay. because we were, we opened that up and then we sort of got in a different direction. At 12, though, too, is when gender segregates really strongly, right, right before 12. So you might play a co-ed team, um, but all co-ed teams need to end by 12. Some are eight, some are nine, at least in New York, right? There's some eight, nine. And, and so there's also kind of just in other sports, not only um, soccer. So there's a gender segregation process that happens and there's a kind of shame that young girls feel in terms of bodily movement or can sort of start to feel for the broader social thing. So in Latin America, what you see is a humongous drop off um, at 12 because there's institutional, bringing it back to the institutional part of it, there's a lot of institutional support for young boys to continue, and, and there's almost none um, for girls to continue, and the idea is that women's access to leisure time, leisure space, becomes more and more limited as they have greater household responsibility. And in that sense, a women's professional league and the national side and supporting that is really inspirational for the women at the grassroots level to make the argument to get that local institutional support. So I think that there's a relationship there between what success is, you know, not not necessarily like everyone needs to create elite athletes, but having elite women athletes is very, very helpful to grassroots women who are trying to build their clubs and say, you know, look at, they can point to people and say, these are the heroines, these are, you know, national representatives, and if you can't protest around an identity you're ashamed of. And it, and so these women being their heroines, I mean, it gives them a lot of fodder to sort of say, you know, look, look at this. So I, anyway, I'm just saying, in the Latin American context, I think there's a strong relationship to having a really successful national side, so professional league where that amateurs 
So success would be more girls playing. And that, <laughs> and that creating elite athletes is all, always detrimental to that. So yeah. it might be helpful. And this leads me to think too, because like, one of the things that I struggle, I mean, there's like two things I struggle with, with as a fan in relation to the media, and also like as a writer, like, like when you can pitch a story or even like try to enter into the conversation. You know, like, uh, in the absence of the day in, day out daily reporting on, on women's sports in general, but like in general and women's football specifically, um, it's like the story becomes always about the success or failure of the whole sport. And so like every team's story is whether or not, it would only work since far as they embody a, a story of exceptionalism in relationship to the greater failure of like women's sports generally. So it's constantly reproducing a narrative of under, we were talking about this earlier, like the infantilization, underachievement of women's football, like it's, you know, we. We hardly know how to talk about it except in terms of de a developmental narrative, like it's a child who's, you know, like 150 years old. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and that, that actually kind of within a, a broader, especially kind of maybe, like maybe one of the things that women's football in the United States is struggling with is a weird drift in sports culture towards this kind of, like, I don't know anyone working in youth sports who hasn't described exactly what you just described and then it was kind of almost poisonous. Yeah, and as parents in relationship to kids too, it's also like, you know, it's it's not, I mean, some, not all parents or anything like that, but you see it like culturally, you know, just like in a broader sense of like a warped investment in a very narrow range of what a successful practice of the sport looks like, you know, and then you kind of throw into that like a grassroots emerging league culture that's, um, um, you know, that's, that doesn't look like what we're trained to look at, to see and recognize as success. You know, like success looks like an EPL match. It looks like, you know, like eight different cameras on the field and that fly camera over the thing and, you know, and a huge, you know, like, you know, whatever, 70,000 people in the stadium. That's barely even enough for FIFA for World Cups now. Like it's like 80 to, 80 to 100,000 in the, the stands they kind of demand you know, a certain scale of the audience in order to make this television spectator feel like what they're seeing is a success. So we don't know how to how to support the women's game as spectators, right? Um, partly because it doesn't actually look anything like this very conservative sense of what a successful sports spectacle looks like. Um, you your... Well, no, I was just going to say to add to Parlo's uh, comment about the youth, I, I mean, I can't really be involved that much because of the things and the parents, and you see what it does to the kids. And I feel like the next. Nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not one of those, are you? Are you one of those? <laughs> I feel like the next frontier, the next next big money maker, like instead of the you know the velocity acceleration programs where they go to get bigger and stronger and faster, they'll go to like centers to get like mental and emotional support. <laughs> And it's, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be like team building. So anyone out there, I'll throw that idea out there. If anyone wants to, whoever wants to make a lot of money, that's like going to be the next thing. Teams will be sending schools to like, you know, sports psychologist, you know, center or do where they can do right in there. I think it's a great thing, but I just, you know, that's the next, for me, the next frontier with youth sports. And then, and then the other thing, I think, to end maybe on like a success note or happy note, I, I truly believe that everybody that plays soccer and if you could talk about grassroots, but you can also talk about national team level and look with the women when they play on the national team and what they do later in life. Mm -hmm. um, women that play college sports and then they go into sports, uh, they go into the you know, business world, what they accomplish because of what the sport gives them. And when we talk about you know, empowering women, not only in this country, but across the world, I think soccer is a great way to, to really and truly change the world. Um, that's that's just sort of what I've seen and noticed, and it's cool to see like statistics out there now and different websites. Ernst and Young just came out with a survey. I think it was like um, ninety percent of women globally uh, that were interviewed that are in positions of executive leadership all play sports. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who had a total aversion Cream to job culture and corporate culture, like as a punk rock kid in the 80s, I'm like, oh, that kind of scares me, because it's just like, you know, it's a very, it's a very specific way of training people to be successful in the world, right, of sports stuff, but, um, um, you know, anyway, so just like a, 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 a quick reaction to the latter part of what you said, but what, where you're going is actually very similar to some of the, the sto individual stories that Jean is pointing out, you know, which is that something that also gets kind of lost from the record 
you know, are or the way in which like practicing a sport fits into uh, ec- like a, a possible movement towards economic autonomy for individual women athletes, um, you know, who uh, play for a team um, until they're maybe in their late twenties and then move into other kinds of economic activities that surround the sport, like owning a soccer shop, as saw uh, the case of the one um, Italian British player that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and that does, that's an important, that's like the daily life of the, of the sport. And actually that's also <laughs> something that tends to surround the amateur practice of the game. You know, like municipal leagues, right, are peopled by folks who shop in the local soccer shops, right? And there are these kinds of micro economies um, within a city or um, um, just sort of regionally that are actually disconnected from the professional thing, mm-hmm. except it's almost like in its shadow as far as people might be like buying like a Zidane shirt to wear, you know, when they play. Um, and uh, on a team of, like all like bootleg Real Madrid kits <laughs> as their team shirt. You know, anyway, yeah. um, well, we talked a lot about um, girls and females as players, but obviously both of yours up here today, um, having gone through your playing career, but also sitting as coaches and female players coming in as administrators. We spoke about Moya Dodd earlier. So I was wondering if you could speak to maybe the development pathway that you went through to get where you are, and also if you have any ideas or thoughts on, you know, how could it have been easier for you? Um, how can we get more successful female players to come through the game and become the leaders of the game and, you know, be the coaches? Um, you know, in the NWSL, there's only one female coach right now. There used to be two, obviously. Sorry. But... <laughs> 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 you're supposed to go out while you're on top. <laughs> but yeah, so the idea of, you know, how do we, how do we have more people like you um, who are, you know, leaders within the game and we have these great numbers coming into the youth ranks, how do they then become professional? How do they, how do we continue to grow the professional game so that option is available for those, you know, millions of youth players? And even beyond that, how how do you think it would be easier for um, them to become administrators or become coaches, I guess, based off your own experience? Is there something you wish you had that would have made your path a little easier? That's right. I, for me, I I finished playing after the 2004 Olympics, and then I hadn't finished my degree at UNC yet, so I went back and, and finished up my degree, got my degree in middle grade education with focus in science, and at the time, I was trying to decide whether I wanted to become a teacher or to coach, and I was really battling it around with it because I really love teaching, but then also I love soccer and everything about it and everything that it had given me. And then finally my husband said, and it was like an aha moment for me, he was like, Cindy, soccer is teaching. It's just on the soccer field. And it was like that moment for me and I was like, oh, I can do all the things that I love to do in the classroom um, with the kids and teaching and, and having that, but now I can do it in the environment that I also really love and that um, and that you can actually like hug the kids on the soccer field. Mm-hmm. In the classroom. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I always found really awkward. Um, but anyway, so you can have these personal relationships with the kids, and you can really be a part of their development. And you can have you have more than the forty five minutes allotted time with with thirty group of kids, and you get a new thirty, and you get a new thirty. So. Um, so that's how I got my start in coaching. It was, I finally realized that I could have a larger impact on the kids' lives by becoming a soccer coach as opposed to a teacher. And I could teach all those things that I love about soccer and that it taught me. I could then try and help these kids and, and guide these kids along. And so I started coaching as soon as I graduated um, from UNC. And my first year of coaching, I played professionally. I knew what I was doing. I was on the national team. I had no idea. <laughs> I'd never coached other than clinics and camps. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, luckily, my husband had been through all the coaching school, so I was, I was like, he's like, just make up your session and then give it to me. And I was like, I was like, okay, all right. Well, we did this with the national team. It'll work if I do 11s and 17s. I'll just kind of tone it down a little bit. And I mean, I had no idea. I, I hadn't been to a U11 training session since I was. A U11 probably and so I mean I just wish for me that I had had uh, it would have been better for me if I had had some type of education along the way about how to become a coach and how to just the small things about setting up a session um, and childhood development which luckily I got a lot of the childhood development stuff in my education degree 
Um, so just being aware of um, not only athletically and, and where they are in terms of tanner stages of the kids, but also like cognitively, where are they? What are they capable of understanding? Like I read it through from the teaching perspective of, of math, science, and social studies, but to apply that to the soccer field is a little bit different. So, so just thinking about those terms and then, um, because I didn't start my formal soccer coaching education until I think I was four years into coaching and I got my first license. So, um, and you know, soccer is getting better about it. I mean, they are offering more and more licensing, they're doing more coaching, but our country is so big. There are so many soccer players, there are so many teams, there are so many coaches. Um, just in my club, small club in Chapel Hill, it's a challenge to get all the coaches even the most basic education and to oversee all of the coaches. Um, so I think that would be one area that I would have loved is just someone who was at my training sessions helping me out, thinking about different things and, and teaching me along the way um, instead of just learning on the fly, which is basically what I did. Um, and to your other point, how do we get more female at higher, more female coaches at higher levels of the game? I think that's even more challenging um, for me, I absolutely loved coaching in Portland. It was such a great opportunity professionally um, and what a great city to be in, a great team, a great organization with the thorns and the timbers. But in the end, it was like, it was a lifestyle choice. I had lived that life for a long time and my husband was the director of sports science for the timbers. So when we were, we had a home game, they had a away game and vice versa. And so my husband and I were never seeing each other. Um, and for me, and I think this is the same for a lot of couples, like, it, it wasn't worth it to me. I loved it. It was great opportunity. The money was fantastic, but it wasn't worth it in the end to me. Like, I wanted to have my life. I wanted to see my husband. I know, call me crazy. Um, but, I, and then I don't even have kids. And so the women that do have kids, I think coaching presents an even larger challenge to them in terms of travel, especially at that level, and even at the college level, it's challenging. I mean, Carla can talk more about the college level and being a full-time assistant coach. Yeah, I mean, I growing up, I had amazing mentors. I had a fifth grade teacher that um, you know recruited me and two boys and took us all across the metropolitan area um, competing three v three volleyball, and um, you know the soccer coaches. Most of them that I had growing up in new sports were were just good people. Um, they were parents as well, and um, I didn't really have a super crazy club soccer coach. Thank goodness. Um, and and it was it was sort of refreshing to me, you know, after our team was successful with the with the national team, um, just how those people reached out to me and you know congratulated our team and you know, me on success and um, that really made an impact on me you know so many people did so many nice things for me growing up I wanted to give back and I wanted to affect kids lives in a positive way like my life had been affected by these coaches and people that I and my parents surrounded me with and so um, you know I graduated from North Carolina and uh, was had the opportunity to coach here and I jumped right in and um, sort of like Cindy, I wish um, I had had a little bit more training before I jumped in because here you go from this, you know, elite, ultra competitive athlete and now you're in this environment where, you know, these athletes, some of them are probably driven like I was, but most of them not, you know, here they're at this unbelievable university. Um, very competitive university academically and um, you know it was hard for me to um, and we talked about this in your class it was hard for me to um, s like see them on the soccer field and not understand why they just didn't get after it like I got after it on the soccer field and I you know finally the head coach here was a, was a different man Bill Hemp and he like pulled me aside and he's like she did, you know, she didn't want it like you wanted it. You know, she doesn't want to play on the national team, and that's okay. And 
I like, I kind of was like, what? We <laughs> do that's okay. And I, I really, it was kind of my aha moment. Like, not everyone was, was like I was growing up and driven in this war. I mean, I'm sure they chose to do that academically because otherwise they wouldn't be here. And um, so I wish looking back that, you know, she probably thinks I'm a complete idiot. The way I was just on her, you know, to just be great. And um, so I wish, you know, I, I had had some training before I just jumped right into into being a coach. But I'm I'm so thankful for, you know, everything that I was given through my mentors, my teachers, my parents, everything. And I and I want to in turn give back to you know the kids I coach here at Duke and when I help Cindy with with her team. Would you guys like to see more, uh, particularly like U.S. Women's National Team? Like legends such as yourself, you know, coming in and you know being the head. Christine really is such a good example as well, and obviously yourself, but like coming in and coaching in an NWSL, being the institutional like leaders within the NCAA. Oh, uh, Made a prom ball in UCLA is a good example. Is that something that's important? Like, are you important to you? Would you like to see the federation kind of like prioritize that to you know make sure they're ten men of prom balls? Uh, you, I know you've worked some with the. Yeah, so I'm on the Athletes Council for U.S. Soccer and on the Board of Directors. And I think it's important to have athletes in general, not just specifically females, to be higher up um, in U.S. Soccer. I think that's something important that, that needs to be done. But also, like, with, with the college coaches, it's, it's tough. I mean, I think there are many qualified female coaches out there that could take on a Division One program as a head coach and be successful. But there's a lot that goes into that, and there's a lot of time commitment, um, a lot of travel, if you want to be successful. I mean, recruiting alone, forget about the game schedule. The recruiting alone is insane, and it is nonstop. It's only getting worse, too. Yeah, and it's nonstop. And so you have to want that lifestyle. And I don't want it. Carla doesn't want it. Do you guys feel like there's going to be a backlash when that, that kids are choosing the wrong schools because they have to choose so soon? I think I, I, there's choosing too early for me. Um, I chose as a 17-year-old to go to UNC, um, sight unseen, I never even visited. Um, I just yeah, went, you were one of the first players that did that, that yeah. graduated early from high school to go, and now it's like almost commonplace, right? They yeah, it, it worked out it. great for me, but now kids are committing in 8th and ninth grade. It's weird. It yeah. Like that early. Yeah. yeah, but until the NCAA puts a restriction on it, Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. And, and disturbing from a professor's yeah, perspective, yeah, to be awful. quite honest, because it, it, it has no academic, therefore it has no academic <laughs> meaning. <laughs> uh, so we have to get in. Like, sure, but, but it's nebulous then to make those kinds of comments. That's right. And, How do you yeah, go to administration and say, can you give me this eighth grader in the school? Well, that's right. the thing. Right. They're going to score. We can't look at yeah. them. And yeah. right now, yeah. we so don't weird. want to. I mean, um, I want to actually go back to one of the things, things that you said earlier, which is just about like family life as a thing that really impacted the career, the, your decisions in relationship to your career, to like the histories of the clubs that you guys were working with, are working with, because like there's this thing that happens in the women's game that doesn't happen in the men's game, which is it's like the whole person, right, is is in play all the time. Like you, you can't, you know, it's like the, um, you know, the women's like women advocating for their right to just play because it's like something that you just do for yourself and because it's fun is very difficult in the context of just like grassroots municipal game, especially, you know, once once the athletes are of childbearing age, you know, or, if, you know, just like your responsibilities to everyone else in the household comes before yours. So just like showing up, if you've ever tried to like run a women's team, you know, just having athletes show up is such a huge deal, not because they're not committed to the sport, but because they have to navigate the sport in relationship and to so many other commitments and the value that's placed on something that they do just for themselves is really mm -hmm. small yeah. you know and, it, and it's like that's actually a side of the women's game that I actually don't mind in a way right because it's not okay that men just get off the hook with regards to all these other responsibilities right you know that it's like that's an interesting element of like the sustainability of the women's game so far as to have a sustainable environment you have to actually support people's relationships to each other, the relationships to their families and their kids. And if you don't do that, you're not actually going to have the top women in the sport because at some point, 
you know, that's, this is this actually, this is a constant issue. I mean, and it, it may keep, for example, a lot of women at D3, where you don't have um, uh, athletic scholarships, uh, it's just like a lower key recruitment thing, you know, where you can have, uh, speaking as someone whose sister is a D3 coach, that there are aspects of that that are support an ongoing relationship to the sport and an ongoing relationship to family um, that's harder to sustain at a D1 level without much more aggressive um, um, external support for like a family stuff. So I would even go further back to the youth. Yeah. Um, and just letting these kids grow up and be well rounded, not just in sports, but I mean, I remember one of the kids on my U12 team, dad came up to me and told me that her, his daughter wanted to be in the school play and asked me permission for her to be in the school play. <laughs> And I'm like, wait, let me get this right. You are asking me permission to have your daughter audition for the school play? It's like, that's not how it works. You tell me that, hey, you think this is a great opportunity for your daughter, a great learning experience for her to audition for the school play. It will impact the soccer in this way. Um, but we think it's, as a family, important for her to do it. And that goes, kind of goes back to something that you said earlier is, we as parents have to advocate for our kids because these coaches will not. Mm -hmm. A lot of them will not. Um, and you know, you have you know your child, you know your family situation, and you have to do what's best for you and your family and your child. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, just this is also getting back to what Monica said about these <laughs> days. Like my daughter is thirteen, she's five eight, and she plays basketball and soccer. But her technical director from soccer says she has to choose now. Oh. So I have to, part of, luckily for a club, they offer a sports psych to evaluate the kids. So sports psych says your daughter's about to have a breakdown because she doesn't want to choose. Football's mama's sport, basketball's my husband's sport. Mm -hmm. So we're not, <laughs> I, we, I don't care. I've started to learn about basketball, whatever. Let me go in and cheer and ice Probably the wrong things, but whatever. Like I'm trying to be supportive. I don't want her to have to go through that. And she's like, it, it's funny on the one hand, and the other work I do as a sports activist and working on a global level, is people often use football as sports therapy for women that are trauma survivors from stuff. So on the one hand, you've got it inflicting trauma and stress on young women because of this. And on the other hand, I've got contacts in Afghanistan and Pakistan. They're like, we need your ideas about how we can use football to empower and enlighten and help girls. And I'm like, these are so, in the same sphere, it's so weird. Yeah. And that goes back to my point of the youth coaches. Like, they want to be the coach that develops that next elite player. I mean, like, and we all want to develop players. I'm not saying that that should go away, but we have to develop the person as, at the same time. And if we're causing this damage to them, we're not developing them. I mean, I'm lucky in one hand, she's a, she's a goalkeeper, so the goalkeeper coach would say, no, keep her in basketball because it helps. But if she wasn't, by... Basketball helped me in soccer. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like hand-eye, but by May, he wants an answer. Like, what is she doing? You know, it's five times a day of training. Continue playing both and find this try. Yeah. Right where you were trying to get into. I was just trying to say that there are actually, it's interesting, there are some um, in the working class in the Vichas, I don't know if you saw the previous Coca Pelotas, are you saying the same thing? That, and, and actually, there's a few different initiatives to change even some of the roles to allow for more substitution yeah. so that they can switch off with the babies. Yeah. Oh. And, and on the one hand, it is infuriating because you say these women deserve their leisure time, they yeah. deserve, but in realistic terms, yeah. um, their own personal battles may may not mean that they can do that or they don't have a partner to just say, hey, you're going to take care of the baby. And and that was one of the most interesting things for the infant in the car seat stroller mm -hmm. and then the coach also allowing more substitution so that, in fact, the whole league. Yeah. Has it that they kind of rotate after? How many was it like? I don't remember exactly what it was. I, yeah. But they well, right? and, so, yeah. and something like that actually allows kids to grow up in the context of women's oh, sports, yeah. 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 which has all these additional benefits, yeah. right? Which Absolutely. is huge, you know. And they have to do their homework. Yeah, forever. that's that's like my son. I mean, yeah. at times I'm thinking, am I doing the right thing here? him away from his dad, but then I'm thinking, look at all these unbelievable women he gets to be around all <laughs> the time. You know, his dad's pretty awesome too. <laughs> yeah. I think that the other sorry, no, no. Yeah, I think that the other really interesting thing from the documentary um, and the associated sort of studies of it was that it was sort of the reverse of some of your concerns about the parents advocating for the children while the coaches are pressuring them. It was almost the reverse, where the coaches were in an advocacy role. 
um, advocating for more leisure time for the children um, yeah. and mm -hmm. the coaches offering especially for the young women, and the coaches offer very specific strategies for getting through their chores yeah. quicker, right. or getting through their homework quicker, and making sure that those things were taken care of. So it wasn't saying, well, no, your brother should take over the chores, you shouldn't have to do this, because that was too big of a battle, but rather figuring out ways that women could carve out. Could you say the name of that documentary? It's yeah. Mujeres yeah. con Pelota, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's Argentine, it is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a little bit expensive yeah. right now, but universities can get it streaming for cheaper. Yeah. I just got Hofstra to get it. Um, but it's women with balls, balls. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which yeah. is not a, a great literal translation yeah. of that. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really, I, I mean, it's, you know, but it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. Mujeres con pelota, and it's and, and, and the and the great thing too is that you see kind of the confrontation that women have to do in informal soccer spaces for the space itself in the city. Yeah. So the coaches are actually have to boot off repeatedly, boys, repeatedly, and yeah. say it's our turn to play here. It's our turn to play here, and the girls are in a kind of constant. No, I just do a lot of traveling, and it's like that in a lot of. Yeah, and it's, it's it's a real battle where they say, look, we signed up for this municipal slot and you have to get out of here. And it's it's, it's really a, a different kind of struggle where it's a, it's a class among working class teams, and this also happens in Queens because yeah. I've spent a lot of time in those parts. Yeah. Uh, girls cannot get in edgewise in, in, in Queens, yeah. into those parks. So in working class spaces where it's not organized, it's almost... You know, really combative to just get mm -hmm. the space. That I mean, right. to take it to the informal level, like the, I mean, all of these issues shape this thing that's sort of like this, you know, the given that women don't play pickup. Mm -hmm. You know that you don't. I mean, it's. I mean, if you play, pick, if you're like a pickup nut, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're often one or it's like one or one of two, um, and and you might try to bring more in, but like I've never in Los Angeles, I have never stumbled onto or found in my, you know, uh, women dominated pickup game. Um, and in fact, whenever we've kind of tried to sustain like a pickup scene, you have to proactively, like as a policy, it's like for every man you bring in the game, you have to bring two women. Like, you know, that um, which you can't, which is almost unenforceable without having really long feminist processing sessions <laughs> with everyone. Because it's like, you know, uh, if, you know like, if you'll not, you're likely to know casually as a woman more guys who play who you want to play with than more women who play that you want to play with. So like, you know, every, it was gender neutral whether or not you were a problem in recruitment. Um, and, uh, you know, now I think all of that goes to that kind of thing about like traditions around, you know, pleasure and sustaining people's happiness in that way. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, you had mentioned that you um, travel a lot overseas for soccer and I, I've seen like stories on some of the trips that you've done. Um, I'm forgetting the organization. Goals um, for Girls. Goals for Girls. I was just wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk about that a little bit um, and thing. kind of what um, what your goals are and what you kind of hope to achieve um, with them in the future. Yeah, so it's an amazing organization. So I got teamed up with them in 2000, I think 2007 was my first trip. Um, Tiffany Roberts Tejeda, who was a teammate of mine at UNC, and then also a teammate of ours on the national team. Um, she had gone on a trip with this organization, and they were going to South Africa, at, but she couldn't go because she was pregnant at the time, and they asked who else would want to go, and they mentioned me. So that's, that's how I got um, in with the organization. But basically what we do is we, both domestically and internationally, we teach life skills through soccer. Um, so we've been focusing mainly on South Africa and India and just teaching um, a lot of different healthy lifestyles. And the focus changes slightly based on the environment we're in and the ages that we're working with. But we tend to take girls from the United States over to these countries with us and do cultural exchange. And we try to match up the ages of the girls that we bring with the ages of the girls that we're going to be working with in country. And it's just a, it's, I mean, it is, like, I can literally watch girls' lives change before my eyes. It's an unbelievable organization. And we just do all the different kinds of fun life skills activities, and then we bring it onto the soccer field and do um, more life skills activities while also teaching soccer skills. 
And some of it is more just exposing girls to soccer because they've never been allowed to play it. Um, and some of it they have been playing, it's just teaching them more skills and higher level. Uh, and then also our girls playing, the American girls playing with and against them so that they have a role model of like, oh, girls can play soccer and oh, and they can be really good. Um, so there's a lot of that and it's, I mean, it's just, it's been a blast. So I'm getting ready to go back to India in December of this, this year. How is that funded? <clears throat> Um, so the American girls that we bring, um, they each are responsible for doing fundraising. So we don't prefer for the parents just to write a check. Um, we do a lot of, they, they have to organize a lot of fundraisers for themselves and do letter writing, writing campaigns or car washes or whatever they want to do. And then also we do a nationwide like clinic series mm -hmm. um, to raise money for the organization. I know the state, U.S. State Department sends yeah. um, coaches from the U U.S. Um, youth programs out. I kind of bumped into Mike Dickey. Yeah, in I've been on a couple of those as well. Yeah, yeah. so those are fun. And I was wondering if you had any like any insight or one of the, about that top, that whole thing because that's not very well known. I don't the think. envoys. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about those. They're to look that, like, yeah. So I've been on a few of them. Um, I, I like them. Uh, I mean, and they're very rewarding, but for me, I prefer longer sustainability. Like I, I feel like I go in and I'm there for four or five days and we do all these great programs and it's great for us and it's great for the kids or the coaches that we're working with, but I didn't, there was no follow-up. There was no sustainability. It was like the dog and pony show came in, the dog and pony show left, and that was the end of it. And that's, but in the same on the same token, it was it was still a great opportunity. I, I loved all the sports envoy trips that I went on, and like they were very valuable to me. And I like to think that they were valuable to the people that I was working with. Um, but I I would just love to see those programs. I don't know if it's feasible to continue to go back to the same areas or the same people or the same organizations to continue to to grow them instead of just having this four or five day program. Do you, for goals for girls, do you do part of the grassroots organizations where you go so they can keep those programs going? Right. So, yeah. so part of our program yeah. is we do um, a leave behind grant. So we okay. we go well, in and we work with organizations that are already working yeah. on the ground in country with the young girls or young women, and then we come in and we kind of supplement their program, and then we do a leave behind grant. The girls that we travel with, they get to choose where the money is spent. So we. And then and we continue to go back to these same areas. So um, one of the groups that we worked with, I don't know if you guys have heard of them, is UWA. UWA is amazing. Yeah. yeah so amazing. we did a lot of stuff with them last time we were in India. Yeah. We'll do a lot of stuff with What's them. What's UWA? Um, it's YUWA. I'm not sure what they it is. They do a lot of, in a certain region, in um, Ranchi in, in India, they yeah. do a lot of work around preventing forced marriage and sustaining education for girls because it's a really high rate of yeah. young marriage and forced marriage in that community. And it's also the number one um, for sex trafficking in the world. So um, this is a very at-risk population and so um, it's actually this American guy who has started this organization and they do, they teach them English and help them in school and then also do soccer programming as well and it's just trying I mean, the main focus of it is through soccer and education, delaying early marriage. And so, this to contrast with the State Department thing, if I understand it right, sends coaching coaches to work with coaches. Um, um, and it's kids sometimes. Okay. It's been both right. coaches and kids. Um, and I think it may be more beneficial for that short period of time to work with coaches because then they're imparting on right. a larger population, whereas opposed to just going in and, and doing all these clinics with kids like it's super, it's fun for them some of them have never been white people <laughs> so um so it's very interesting and educational for them in that moment but i think it's that feeling is short-lived yeah i think that it's also more like it's intended more towards perhaps like national development programs and stuff rather than like a kind of community-based um, um socially engaged practice of the sport yeah, it's not through us soccer the envoy yeah program what's the state department with, yeah, with, with the state of soccer. soccer. Right. Yeah. yeah, that just sort of blew my mind was that the State Department had this 
Which I, mean, I don't know why I'd be surprised about that because the State Department has a long history of, of using athletes actually um, as like kind of a cultural diplomacy. Yeah, yeah. Cultural, yeah. So it's girls for girls that work with you. Girls for girls. girls. And because this, this is really fun, you uh, took an under 15 team to Spain and they won bronze in a world tournament, which was really amazing and probably with the support from girls for girls that they got that sustainability is so critical that. Yeah. Work, it's so important. So I'm sure you have a Oh, I just, uh, this is going to pull the conversation. It's a, it's a Twitter it's, question? It's a Twitter question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it goes back. It's from Peter Levy. Oh, um, uh -huh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry to pull it because it's actually going to the right. Uh, but uh, youth development for girls in the United States, um, and, and I'll tie it into Latin America as well, actually. Um, but this is specifically to, to Cindy and Carla. Is the pay to play system that we have the best model for youth development for girls um, is the question what, and what would alternatives be and then sort of how does that work how does development girl development work in Latin America that's another question from Twitter um, you know why is what impedes the, the development of, of youth soccer for girls in, in Latin America that's a softball yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard to pay to play because you know you have money you can do it if you don't yeah, and, and I know lots of youth organizations, um, lots of club teams have um, scholarships for kids that they can you know, give out to them so that they are able to play. But um, you know, those scholarships are used up, and then the money's out, and then kids are left out. You know, unfortunately, um, you know how can how can that be you know better? I'm not sure. I mean, you you work with the club, so you might be able to, you know, speak on that just a little bit more. But I think access to the sport goes beyond just financial means. Um, there's a lot of logistical means and societal mm -hmm. means um, that go into being able to access the sport, especially the way it is in the U.S. Um, you go travel around the world, and you can't travel more than a few miles without seeing a pickup game. You know, regardless if it's in the middle of the street, um, a dirt field, or on the beach, wherever it may be, you don't see that. Everything is hyper organized here. You know, everyone has their calendars and what time they have to be at every field and court, and music lesson, and um, and that and how do we change society? I don't know. That's way beyond my level of expertise. Um, so, so finances are an issue. In terms of access to the sport, um, I know my club gives away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars um, in scholarship money, but I don't think that's the main thing, main thing that's keeping kids from playing in this country. I think it's um, more logistical and societal issues. Yeah, because it's like if you can't imagine, if you, because I mean, Los Angeles would be, I first thought you were talking about the United States, because in Southern California, you can't really go very far without seeing pickup. And I always love flying in. If you fly into LAX, just look out your window and you'll actually see if there's a baseball field, which are very easy to spot from a plane, there's a pickup game on it. Because right? people don't play. And it's the soccer matches in the municipal leagues that actually pay for the lights to light the baseball field at night. You know, that it's after golf, it actually produces the highest degree of revenue. But like, um, um, and because it's cost next to nothing to participate in municipal soccer. But there's no connection between your participation as a kid in those leagues at all, and like club soccer or like the um, development program, except in almost like a mythologic. There's like a mythological sense, like you kind of know that world is there, but you have no sense of how to get there. And like uh, one of the biggest high schools in the area where I live, which also plays, it's like host to one of the best pickups. It's like a uh, La Next, they call, I think they call it, but it's like a five. A five-a-side brutal, it's a brutal five-a-side that's played on a tennis court that's been going on for years there, and there's a lot of gambling around it and everything, and like, and uh, the guys that play there, it's mostly almost entirely guys, the guys that play there have incredible skill, um, and played in the league I managed, and like two of them, two, one of them actually played um, at Riverside, and then another never went to college and was recruited through the PDL um, that dropped out for a while um, after training with them for years. But so just to say it's like high level play, their coach did nothing but like scrimmage, right? Never talked to a single one of them 
about college at all. You know, like at all. Like it's just like you have like you know, and the competition to get on that team is ferocious because it's like anyone could have like three quarters of the people who walk in the school or like want to play on the team. You know, it's like this huge, and there's just no relationship between that. You know, and um. And, and and then the world that we know, like it's just no way. There's no no way of knowing. It's like just sheer dumb luck as to whether or not you fall upon like a youth program, you know, that kind of reaches out. You know, it's just really, um, you know, I think it's 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 not just like you need more scholarship money in club teams. It's a societal access, and I think that also goes back to where you started in terms of like professionalism and something. It's like. Do you have, can you get on the field? Like, do you know where the team? How do you contact people? Like, there's just this like really fundamental like non-transparency um, in the system in general that's depressing. I think as well. Anyway. What was that? Well, it's just like what, is, oh, yeah. what are the impediments to sort of youth soccer for girls in Latin America? In, oh, in yeah. particularly in you know in Colombia. <clears throat> I actually want to talk about what things aren't impediments. I, I want to talk about what are the impetuses for playing soccer. One, nice. um, so I think that this is the case in the U.S., but I think it might be the case to a higher degree in Argentina, which is because there's not a tremendous number of women playing soccer, it's feasible that somebody playing in like the worst of the worst leagues is going to be running in to the best of the best women players in the same training spaces or the same tournament spaces. And so I think that it's really that, that perhaps women's soccer in Argentina is unique from men's soccer in the women's ability to see the space or the possibility between themselves as players and, and a higher level of play. And I think that that might be a non impediment. I think that that might be a, a a benefit to young women players, especially, um, and I think that the other, the, I think that the other thing that that is not an impediment to women playing in in Argentina, at least, and I don't know across Latin America, but in Argentina, is that um, there's a tremendous amount of playing space that can be secured fairly cheaply and for uh, you know an hour or two of pickup games. So um, the the documentary is about a media and a team media. This is slightly different than outside field. But um, Buenos Aires, for example, has a tremendous number of um, indoor fields that are in great condition that you can play on for a small fee. Um, so the leagues are a place where working class women, um, migrants from the interior, um, and people from Buenos Aires probably meet and um, can produce new kinds of sociability. Which is a reminder that often in countries like the impediment is the national Federation's yeah. investment it's in capture in like developing what's already there and like and yeah. recognizing even that there is a large community of women who care and, and play well. well yeah. yeah, I would, I I never want to disagree with you, but I'm <laughs> yeah. going to. Okay. Um, no, Isha, I disagree with you on the first point because especially in a place like Brazil, what you really see is Rio and Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. uh, that because there's not a widespread uh, organization that you know the national federation supports the same with AFA mm -hmm. in our in Argentina is that you, that may be true for Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's true of Mendoza. I don't think that's true of, of other cities. But I love the way that you did the non-impediment. Mm -hmm. So your space thing, I totally agree with. And then I just want to add to what you said. The other thing is that soccer is just way more important yeah. Yeah. in South America. And so there is a kind yeah. of a market that's there and an audience that's there that is a huge possibility there. But there are there's a great wealth of rich knowledge and fan traditions and history of these clubs, which are not owned by Qatar Airways, mm -hmm. but are in fact owned still by uh, members of the club. Yeah. And so, so it's not that hard to become a director mm -hmm. of those clubs if you have some degree of time. And there are a lot of women who try to do little coups mm -hmm. of the directorships <laughs> in these clubs, and they, they can make a huge difference. So in that sense, the non-corporate, Part and, yeah. and and like you said, the yeah. space is not. It, it's something it's not you're going to yeah. right. You're going to sort yeah. of jostle with with boys teams, but I also think just the very passion for the game and its development and rich traditions of fan culture yeah. is not an impediment to to women. We have a question from the audience. No, I just wanted to comment. <laughs> um, so I grew up in Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo, and I think that the biggest impediment there and in Latin America in general is 
uh, kind of like the societal pressure in the sense that um, it's very machista. So uh, from a young age, you, I think playing like fields are not a problem, or if girls want to play, they can play. The problem is that there's a pressure from their parents, from schools, from their communities that like, oh, soccer is a boy sport, and so the boys are going to play now, and then girls go inside and play, you know, with dolls, or like, it's like the U.S. is unlike anything I've ever seen, where you have this immense support system from a young age, <clears throat> so women can grow up playing the sport, and in Brazil that just like does not exist at all. It's only towards men. And I think that's the biggest impediment, and it has its roots in like the society of Latin America, like the culture, that is very machista and that, you know, tends to preference soccer only for men. At least that's what I'm saying. It's easier to be the president of Brazil as a woman than the president of a Brazilian football club. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's absolutely. Um, how are we doing on time for a We're well, yeah. wrapping up. We should start at two. Yeah, okay, so we can maybe just take like one or two more questions. I have a question going way back to Carl, something you said like earlier in your session. Um, you talked about uh, criticism of the, oh, sorry, I think I mean, you might have mentioned it too. The criticism you guys received kind of made you feel like, oh, we're almost where the guys are now. Do you know what I mean? Like the criticism from the media. Do you think that actually helped with some legitimacy? Like that criticism, like we talked about legitimacy in terms of presenting women like attendance numbers. Did, did that affect you at all? Did you think that way at all? Or did you just think of this as really crappy that we're getting criticized? No, I thought it was great. <laughs> I mean, even though it was directed a lot at me, I thought it was fantastic. It was the first time I had ever really seen that in the media, in the women's side of, of any sport. I, I really hadn't seen it critiqued to that level. Um, and, and for me, in, in that moment, my husband would be like, hey, did you read this? I'm like, yeah, wasn't it awesome? <laughs> I mean, it was totally criticizing me, but I was like, this is great. Our mm -hmm. sport has arrived, and and I feel like soccer has has been kind of pushing that threshold to to get up there along with tennis and golf, and and for us to, to be at that level of scrutiny and not to be like, oh, the whole league is going to fail if Portland fails. There was that, too, but um, but just for them to critique each player on the team and tactical moves that I made and who I played where. And like, that's usually how on the men's side of the game is critiqued. And then they were critiquing the players, whether they played well or didn't play well or liked them in that position or didn't like them. Um, and it was really the first time I'd seen that. You saw it a little bit during the World Cup. Um, but for me, it was really the first time that I had seen that level of critique uh, in women's sports. I remember in USA Today, remember after each of the games, they all have us on the, in our positions and they give us like a, what, a one through ten or something. <laughs> Not four, what? <laughs> but then just like you were saying, hey, at least we're in there. You know, they're, yeah. it's, a big, it's a big page in USA Today and they're talking about the tournament and our team and so you never I, got a four. Another. And that reminds me too of like something we were talking about a little bit before, which is that there's a lot of um, in the discourse around like um, women's soccer in the United States and development of professional league, et cetera, a lot of faith in social media. And it, it, social media does do things, but like Jean was saying that you know social media has actually always been there for fans of women's football in particular, and it's like it's kind of how we met, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's like you know you that people because you have to you find each other through social media because it's like you're never Gonna, you know, you, you you learn like who knows the most about like who in the United States knows the most about like French women's football, right? And and then you know that person's Twitter Twitter handle where they blog and um, is it Lori from oh, I can't remember now. Is it I want to say Boston? I can't remember now the website. There was like a website where about like seven or eight years ago there was this woman from Northwestern United States. She was like around Portland, I think, or Seattle, and she's obsessed with the French team and French football, women's football. And also just all thing, things French football. So it was like comprehensive walking body of knowledge about French football that was like astonishing, you know. And, you know, I, she wasn't like, she wasn't somebody that was being like, whose perspectives on anything happening in French football, men's or women's, was being published in a mainstream media, sports media outlet, right? Just at all. Like this was, you know. But like that social, in social media, we're kind of like, um, you have this pretty well-defined, passionate community that does need to sustain itself there, but that's not the same as 
USA Today, do, you know, um, providing scores, you know, grades for how players have performed. That's not the same thing as national sports media, like really um, um, giving some of this precious real estate right over mm -hmm. to um, um, any women's sports. Right? It's just not at all the same thing, you know. And that's the thing that actually helps to grow. To my mind, that's the thing that actually helps to. Um, it's a big step, you know, and it really does create. It's a thing that like somebody doesn't really know that much about the sport will learn something, you know, and then you might start find yourself in conversation about it, right. right? You're more likely to sit next to someone on a train who knows something about it. Even in England, you know, where we are used to thinking about like women's sports being not as advanced as it is here, in England you'll find that there are more people who are likely to know who's at the top of the women's game, like what club team is at the top of the women's game, partly because it seems to never change, but um, you know, but there's like just more like ordinary awareness, partly because actually British media actually gives more space to women's football than American media does to women's football, which is bizarre when you think about it. You know, that's that's annoying. Um, I don't know why I'm looking at you. I know you agree with me. Yeah. 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 It's actually like the perfect transition to the yeah, next panel, yeah. which will solve that problem. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, so. so um, yeah, just, and I, I mean, it's true that this this event really is the product of social media too. I mean, yeah. most of the main connections are <laughs> social media. Um, but so thank you for moderating. Yeah, and thank you for putting us in the same room together. Because it's one thing to follow each other's Twitter feeds; it's another thing to actually get to know each other in real, real time. Take selfies. It's a selfie. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.